Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hue virtual chat. It is another beautiful, hot August morning. And, you know, through doing months now of these chats, I have gotten to know so many fascinating and amazing women and men as well. But I just want to say a big, big congratulations and thank you for being a great friend to Amy Tung. She is the founder of the I Am Love Project. And this year, is celebrating their second anniversary. And wow, she had an amazing lineup of big workshops and wonderful events all to be had during 2020. And of course, now we know all of those events have been canceled, but not quite. We've been able to carry out her great project through virtual and she is celebrating with a big event called the Grow Conference that is happening on Thursday, August 20th at the Fairmont Hotel. So it will be a live event with an audience, safe, uh, socially and safely distancing, of course, and also virtually as well to people well, across the country. And so today we want to promote it. We want to meet some of the very incredible speakers as part of that event. And it's really all about how we can shift stress into resilience, convert distraction into productivity, and transform circumstances into results. So let's open it up to our wonderful guests. We'll talk more about also making a great workplace for Black people and so many more people of color. And here they are. Hello, Robin. How are you doing? Hi, Angela. Hi. Wonderful to see you. Hi, hi, Linda. Hey, hi, Michael. Oh, and hi, Joyce, welcome. And we've got Susie there. Hello, Susie, and hi, Nanette. It's great to see you. Oh, well, everybody's enjoying this hot weather. I mean, oh, oh, at, least, at, least, at least Mother Nature, right, is, is being nice to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to welcome, we have some very special guests here. We've got Joyce Adidison, we've got Michael DePizer, and we've got Linda Dostowicz. And they're all going to be guest speakers at the GROW conference. And ladies, this is going to be an amazing event to, you know, for one, get together because it's going to be at the Fairmont. And, you know, I believe there's tickets still available. So, and if you say, if you go onto our Instagram, you can get a discount. Um, but anyways, more importantly, too, we'll be connecting virtually. And I'm sorry, Michael, I have to include you too, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, <laughs> uh, I think you're our third uh, male on the show, so you mm. are special. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Not Thank bad, you. yeah. All right, so I'm gonna start with our guest speakers um, and just for Nanette and Susie and Angela and Robin too, we're talking about, well, the workplace, yes, um, but also on how to make it a better workplace for all people of color, race, status. And um, you know what these three bring to the table, their own wisdom and their own, I think, very um, deep thoughts that really can change you know, people that don't know a lot about this topic. So that's what I'm here to today to hopefully open it up to everybody that's watching to ask questions. That's a big thing, right? Ask questions. So because you're so special, Mike, I'm gonna go to you first. Um, got your red shirt on, red. I'm board. ready. Yes, you're ready. Okay, so, you know, first of all, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself and more importantly, how you kind of did your own personal transformation. Yeah, so basically, um, it's quite a long story, um, but to cut it short, um, I'm no different from anyone else, but I have this interior motivation to always evolve. Um, I have a, a theory that I practice in life that my comfort zone is my uncomfortable zone. So whenever I become comfortable, it's a red flag for me. And I'll do some crazy things like almost jump off a bridge equivalent. <laughs> so basically, um, I'm a student of life. I like to listen and learn and observe with the intent to understand what people say, doesn't matter who it is. And I found a lot of commonalities in life by doing that. So um, in my journey, I was able to practice some of these mindset um, um, things. Um, I quit my job, high paying job. I quit it one day and I documented every single day until I found my um, opportunity just sharing people. This is how the world works. When you make a decision to jump out, the world literally gives you resources. You just see things differently. When I was going to work every day, my high paying job it was amazing, but I was able to only see a certain perspective. When I quit, I had those raw emotions and the same things that were around me paired differently. So I acted on them. So long story short, I guess what I'm going to do is share my story eventually, 
um, on the 20th. And without, within that story, because I documented every single day, I'm going to pull out some of the mindset stuff that I had to rely on to overcome some of those fear-based ideas that we had and share with someone how everybody has this ability. You know, I call this thing in our head the jail we don't know about because the jail we know about is behind bars, limited visitation. But this one, people die with, you know, the ghost of what I could have done, the ghost of potential. So I'm going to share with people why no one on this planet is any different. It's all about just taking action, but reframing some of these feelings that we have in order to do that. So um, I feel that, you know, I just want to share a different perspective um, so that people could see things from a different lens. And, and then I'm going to show people what I actually did, the tactical things. There's three things that I break it down to, process, mindset, and setting goals. So what I actually did. And then I'm going to share ways that people could do that themselves in order to kind of get rid of some of those limiting beliefs. Wow. I mean, and especially now, right? I mean, people are trying to reinvent themselves, not because they want to, uh, but they're forced to in a lot of situations. But I'm going to now, I'm just going to move in and get everybody and, and then we're going to start talking. So hi, Linda. How are you doing? Linda Distalich. So I mean, okay, give us a little bit of a glimpse of who Linda is. <laughs> and what she's going to bring to the table on the 20th. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Tracy. And hello to everyone. I am, I was super excited that Amy uh, asked me to be a part of the GROW conference. Uh, we had a dialogue going back and forth because she switched this conference to having more of a focus on the Black Lives Matter movement. She wanted to bring that a commitment to challenging ideas and stereotypes to this conference. And I wanted to make sure that uh, I was not taking the spot of anyone else who should be speaking. Um, my role uh, very much is to model listening, learning and acting. I, that is my, what I'm bringing to the table. I will also be speaking, but uh, uh, I really do, um, in, especially in the last few months, as we've seen so much uh, racial discrimination happening, uh, I have committed myself and my business to uh, really looking at diversity issues. Um, and I, that, that is one thing that I am bringing to the, to the table on, uh, to the GROW conference is my, um, my willingness to, as Michael said, uh, be really comfortable being uncomfortable and being willing to change, being willing to, um, challenge my own beliefs and the system that we live in, that we all live in. Uh, so that is, um, one thing that I'm bringing to the table. And then as well, I, uh, I'm a life coach and I bring to the table an ability to see people in their potential as, uh, Michael, you put it really in an interesting way, the ghost of potential. I think so many people live with this almost an alternative view of themselves that's kind of out there that they think they should be like, and they don't know how to get there. They're, 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 they're here and they know they want to be somewhere else and they don't know how to get there. And it is a lot of uh, mindset stuff, as Michael said, uh, but then I also come at it uh, from very practical habits. You know, the things that we can do, the actions that we can take, the small steps every day that we can take um, that build that confidence to create change. Um, I always come at it that confidence, uh, you can sit around waiting and reading books and looking at videos to try and build confidence, but it's not going to come until you take action until you get into that messy, ugly, weird space that's awkward and you feel like you're failing. That's it. That's confidence. <laughs> that, that's what it feels like. I, I think we think confidence feels, um, oh, just easy and splendid. And, you know, you just all the time walk around in this haze of glory. No, confidence is that willingness to put yourself out there fail and uh, fail publicly. And then uh, that, so that to me is, is uh, my idea of, of action, confidence, and the practical habits you need to get there. So uh, that's what I'll be, that's 
kind of the general stuff of what I'll be talking about on uh, on Thursday. Oh, wow. So does that mean that President Donald Trump has a lot of confidence? <laughs> <laughs> Misguided. <laughs> Misguided confidence. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, and Joyce, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so, for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more again about yourself and then what your topic and what you're going to bring on the 20th. Are you, you're, you're still oh. talking to no, to, me? to Joyce. To Joyce. Oh, to Joyce. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Joyce Adidison here. I'm founder of Interpersonal Wellness Services, Inc. And I have been speaking for 23 years. I have been teaching and training others. And uh, it's I'm so excited to be uh, part of the conference when Amy told me what she was doing. I come from a different perspective as a conflict analyst and uh, what we do is we transform difficult behaviors and habits into uh, competencies that people can use to work, live and play well. So over the last um, journey of my life, the last almost a quarter of a decade, 25 years of, of working in this field, I have uh, worked with many, many people who were struggling because, and I think similarly to what Michael and, uh, and Linda said, is we forget that everything we do in life is a skill and it's learned. And sometimes we don't know how to learn. So part of my job, I, I, I believe I was called to teach, coach and mentor. And uh, one of the things we do at Interpersonal Wellness Services, we teach corporates. I'm a corporate trainer. I specialize in workplace wellness. And we have created the nine dimensional wellness improvement system model that teaches people how to see wellness from a very different perspective. And I'm not just talking about wellness, you know, mental and emotional and physical. I'm talking about nine elements of wellness, nine pillars of wellness that we can institute in our lives. And so a lot of my work focuses on teaching what I call the wellness competencies. So there's a difference between skills and competencies. Skills is what we do. Competencies is how we execute. And so in that work, I'm looking to work with individuals who are, they know they have some skills, but they don't quite know how to execute at the level and be able to measure that and to see results, uh, consistent results that's growing. And that's where, that's my happy spot. As a, as a conflict analyst, I see many people who challenge with conflict situation, relational issues, and they, they know that they should practice effective communication and that they should resolve issues. And we've all read the book. We all know how to do that. But doing it takes competence. And you have to build that where it becomes that unconscious competence, where it becomes part of your repertoire. It now is part of that neural pathway that's developed. It's that anchoring heuristic that we just do it because it is part of us. It now becomes part of our, our value system. And, and one of the exercises I do with people, I said, what are your values? And I love it when they try to tell me the values they would like to have versus the values that they execute. And I go a step further with my clients. They said, so if I moved in across the street from you, oh, I take that, you know, that, that visitor's uh, spare bedroom in your home, I'm going to see those values. And that gets them to pause and ask, oh. So it's, it's fascinating when we think we are doing something, but then when we start measuring it, we recognize, oh, I could do better. I could do better. And so the question is, how did you do your best today to execute at a higher level? And what would be my best? My best today may not be my best tomorrow. And recognizing that these, there, you know, they are, this is a dynamic process. And when I teach the, the wellness competencies, they, they actually connect with uh, the nine wellness dimensions. So we do spiritual wellness, social, emotional, occupational. We do intellectual. And I think that a lot of what the, uh, Michael talks about falls into that intellectual wellness and capacity building that we have. And then we'll be going into, uh, uh, we'll be looking at environmental wellness, financial wellness, physical, and then 
Uh, one of my favorite is interpersonal wellness, of course. How do we have those interpersonal relationships that enhance our life? Uh, recognizing and knowing when we, the relationships are taking too much energy from us and it's depleting our wellness and how to get back, how to correct things and get back to the place where we need to be. So that's a little bit in essence of what I do. Uh, we have the, uh, we've ha we br I brought the only life coach training to Manitoba, the first one back in 2013. We've been training and certifying coaches around the world in our nine dimensional uh, wellness coaching model. Our coaching program is an ICF approved. So it's the, um, it was the first ICF approved program in uh, Northern Ontario, Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And uh, we've been here and working. We work with uh, employees every day teaching them how to implement the wellness competencies so that they can, they can have life after work. We're not draining all our energy at work and, and coming home empty and, and lifeless and have nothing to live for because work is intended to enhance our life, not the other way around. So that's a little bit in a nutshell of what I'll be doing. Wow. So, I mean, I guess, yeah, we all have to come to this conference or at least <laughs> join in virtually because there's so much to talk about. And then I'm going to um, also add, too, what's going to be interesting is that we'll have a super talk. And this one is focused on making a great workplace for Black people. And I think that is another huge conversation. So um, I'm going to open it up to Michael again, too. Mike, what is, what is the climate like or what is the environment like right now for Black people in the workplace? You know, it's, 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 it's hard for me to understand that overall, um, because again, we, I believe we don't see life how it is, we see it how we are. So, you know, for instance, this COVID environment in general, you know, it just brings out people's natural personalities that they already had embedded in with them. Whereas I always been a happy person, so I was able to use this environment to make tons of opportunity. I feel like I'm living my best life right now because when certain things like this happen, anything tough in our life, a lot of people skew towards either that victim side or, or that, that the side where the majority skews. But I often find on the other end, there's always tons of opportunity. And that's what COVID gave me. So on, on, on February 7th, I broke my life down into five areas and I was able to really strategically make plans for those areas and now living the best life I have. So I, 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 I feel like um, it depends on the perspective. Um, so it's hard for me to understand um, certain different perspectives that I, I haven't experienced. Now, when I look at my side of things, I don't see any problems or solutions in life. Everything's an opportunity. So I find that it's often the setbacks is where you're able to ex excel. So I feel like when I ever have what's perceived as a setback, it's the only thing that propels me to move forward because in life, again, when you're comfortable, you achieve absolutely nothing or it's slower growth. But when we have these hard situations in our, our life, whether it be something catastrophic in a family, you're able to ask hard questions. When COVID came, it allowed people to realign their businesses. So it's either you change or the world will force change on you. So I feel like um, depending on the perspective, some could turn it into um, um, a different way of, um, I guess, sharing in a positive light. And some would be, could become victim to their circumstance. Um, so it's one of those situations where I would just share awareness so someone could see a different perspective and then maybe that would allow them to see things differently. So it's, it's really a tough question to answer. Yeah, and I know you're right. Everybody will have their own opinion. Uh, I'm just going to say welcome to my friend Angela. So like we're on, hi, and, and how are you doing? The family's all good and everything? Family's all good, keeping busy. <laughs> oh, yes, good, good, good. Well, and that just maybe your kind of reflection on, on this topic. Um, you know, maybe things of, that you have seen or felt you could bring to table. Yeah, I mean, I think um, similar to what Michael said, I, I think we can't lose a sense of optimism and we can't uh, feel disempowered within the environment. Uh, but I've received phone calls and people asking, uh, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement, I had someone call me and say, it must be very difficult to be a Black person in the workforce right now. Um, and I thought that to be a very interesting question because um, the challenges being faced systemically and institutionally have not started over the last eight weeks, three months. Uh, the fact that they're systemic and institutional have been uh, a reality that people have been navigating in workplaces 
for years and years and years. It's just the awareness of others that uh, the impact on people's uh, physical and mental well-being and that these barriers have at times prevented people from uh, fully expressing who they are and fully achieving uh, their full potential within particular workplaces. And, and at times, it's for an individual then to reflect whether this is the right location for me to use my skills and it might mean a change. Uh, but there are many people who don't have uh, that, that ability, that capacity, um, and then are uh, continue to work in environments that um, uh, don't allow them to express themselves fully and, and reach their full potential. So I think that um, the optimism is that there are more people, and, and Linda, you shared this, who are actively listening in a way perhaps that we haven't uh, felt, who are uh, actively seeking answers. Uh, but I think it's also important to remember to not put the burden in your particular workplace on the black employees or the indigenous employees or the workers of color to then find the solutions. Um, there are so many resources out there uh, that people can go to. And it's not that you don't want to speak to the people in, in your environment, but it's extremely important for you to do that individual work first and perhaps begin to reflect on what your own biases are, whether they're conscious or unconscious. And I think it's about moving those unconscious ones to consciousness so that you can begin to uh, deal with them in a more concrete way and uh, creating an environment that's safe for these uh, conversations. That means doing your individual work uh, first. So it is an important time. I think there is a sense of momentum and it's from that momentum that many people are drawing hope. Uh, but I think uh, understanding that it's not uh, in light of the circumstances of George Floyd's murder that those realities um, started. Those realities have been part of uh, Black people's lived experience within the workplace, uh, let's say forever. <laughs> um, and so uh, we are in 2020, better late than never, but then let's move these things towards action in a sustained and systemic way so that it's not for each individual to have to advocate within their space, but that it is the space that recognizes the need to adjust to create a more inclusive space for everyone. All right. Susie, you're listening or do you have something to add? She's like, oh. <laughs> oh, no. I'm just nodding along completely to what Angela is saying is that, um, you know, this stuff has always been there and now it's just a matter of other people becoming wise to it and um that is a little bit shocking i think for some people to really kind of grasp the reality of but i mean the reality is is that for most people um we can't put away our skin color at the end of the day and just you know pretend that this is not happening or that um you know we are not experiencing what we're experiencing on a daily basis and that's a really difficult thing for some people to wrap their heads around. And that's why, you know, in this day and age, with everything that's happening with all the protests and the awareness and the resources, like Angela said, they're out there. There's tons of things that you can read to educate yourself on what's happening, what has happened, you know, 40, 50, 100, 400 years ago to get up to speed, so to speak. And um, I always say um, in so on my social media posts and things like that, Racism in this day and age is a choice. You're making an actual choice to not be anti-racist if you're if you're refusing to believe that this is happening or whatever it is. There is zero excuse as to why this should be happening. And we've said this, I've said this before on this on this program is that imagine what we could actually do with our resources and our talents and our time if we weren't living in a systemic system in or in a system that actually thinks that not everybody deserves equal rights or that you know not everybody is equal or that not everybody deserves to you know have the same oh, we lost you a little bit there same sort of privileges and opportunities and it's in each of us to educate ourselves and not just ourselves but our children um you know people that are us we need to and there is 
so that we can be doing with our time and our energy to make this world a bit for everybody. Uh, well said. Well, we kind of lost you a little bit, but we definitely heard your message here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you want to know what's really happening at my house today? Okay, so I, I don't know if you guys have kids, but there's a new version of Apex Legends or something, so my Wi-Fi is very unstable today, thanks to my children playing downstairs. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's what reality is in my house today. <laughs> oh, I know. So yeah. Oh my God. So yeah, because you were kind of cutting in and out, and it was just like, oh, we're all kind of nodding your head. We got like you know a few words in there, but no, very well said. But hey, and it's like what we're all doing, right? Trying to balance. I'm gonna uh, throw it up there to Robin. Thanks for joining us, Robin. And uh, you always bring your enlightenment because um, yeah, she's <laughs> no, you do. And, and you know, talking about mental health and wellness and stuff. I mean, and Angela was also, I mean, there are the people of color that are feeling, you know, this oppression, if, for lack of a better word, but does that also have the reverse though on their mental health and wellness too, and for others and how they perceive them? So like, yeah, there's that whole thing of, you know, how do I talk to this or, you know, how do I address this or, and that just creates a lot of angst as well. Um, I've got angst talking in this group because I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, but I, you know, yeah, I think I I can't even imagine what it's like. I was just uh, running a peer training, and uh, one of the guys um, who's indigenous, we were talking about sharing stories and connecting with experiences. And he was talking about he had an incident where his roommate pulled a knife on him and he went to the police and they asked where his roommate came from and it was this white neighbourhood. And then they said, where are you from? And he said the nation he was from. And he said they basically went, well, what did you do to create this? And I, you know, talking to people about the workplace too, that, that stuff is is still rampant, and you know I can't imagine what that is like on my mental health every day. I can I know about my mental health being in workplace, you know, as a I don't know kind of weird little transgender half, not quite God, dealing with that. Um, but I can I kind of still walk in and and go, well, I'm white, I'm good. Um, I, when you guys were talking, there are, there are a couple of things for me. I, I did this course a couple of, it was probably 10 years ago now, and it, it really had me think about, is it equality or is it equity? And the, the presenters were talking about, it was done at one of the traditional black universities in the US, and they had the black professors come in and play Monopoly. And then they brought the white professors in after everything was brought up. And they said, oh, here you go, you've got the same start. Here's the same starting money. And the white professors got super upset and said, well, that's not fair. Like we're already behind. And like, it was such a powerful thing for me to think about whether it's a workplace or whether it's society about if we're already starting on a different foot, how the hell do we think giving people the same is equal? And like, I, I feel like a bit of a fraud talking in this environment because I come from Australia where we treat indigenous people like crap. Um, but I did get a chance of living in New Zealand and spending time working with a lot of Māori and kind of not experiencing anything that they go through, but, but getting that sense that how can we start to look at equity? Um, because I don't, I don't, I, I can't even imagine where equality is going to come for a long time. Um, God, I, 
I don't know what to say. Charlotte said, go on this one. I'm like, okay, it's not my wheelhouse. But I do, I do want to jump in really quickly. Joyce, when you were talking, and Michael, when you were talking, um, and Linda, about the opportunity piece and, like, finding those gems for people. Um, whoever we are, one of, the, one of the things I run is a, a course called Unleashing Your Awesomeness. And I have people look at those things that people say are negatives. And because I work in mental health, right, non-compliant, manipulative, they're always the goodies. And um, like manipulation, you have to be an awesome group negotiator. Like you have to be a stunning negotiator. You have to be creative. You have to be strategic. And it's, if we start engaging workers in those conversations rather than based around those negative pieces we've a shot at seeing people blossom i don't know if that makes sense but i felt like i wanted to to say that that um yeah now i'm going to shut up because i feel like i'm all over the show today well no, that's what i do with you you know I, I i take you on a different tangent but i do love that whole thing between equity and equality and it's true. We have all started at different starting points. And, you know, even, uh, and I want to, and everybody too, that have children, right? And it's, as parents, we only want to make the best for them, you know, better than what we have or whatever. And we want to have them have the world, you know, in their hands and be able to do anything. But we all know that's, it's pretty hard to do. And I mean, we do the best of it and we make, and we try to do the best of it. So I don't know, Joyce, you have all the years of doing this. <laughs> what is it? What is a trick to finding, like Robin said, those gems, you know, those little diamonds in the rough and people that you can polish and become brilliant. You know, it's, People, it's helping people to see those for themselves. Over the years in my career, I've worked with some of the most resistant and hard to reach employees. So some of my client organizations, well, before they fire someone, they have to send them to work with me just in case. <laughs> and so I find working with these individuals, helping them to see within themselves things that no one else could see because it's so often you get labeled in the workplace. You get brand, you know, they say create your brand. Well, at work, somebody will create a brand for you. If you, if you don't have the ability to create a brand for yourself and be self-determined as to what your brand is, you get branded at work and you get labeled. And unfortunately you get stuck in that. And most people see, see themselves based on how uh, they're being treated at work. Let's face it, we spend most of our working life at work. And in the Western world, our identity is based on our work. When we meet people, we ask them, what do you do? We don't ask them, are you a mother? Are you a wife? Or are you, you know, what are your values? Most people don't even know what their values are. We ask them, what do you do? A lot of times, people identify themselves and their self-worth with their jobs, their profession. And being ill-treated at work or being treated in a manner where you feel less than at work can be very debilitating and uh, a real uh, blow to your emotional and spiritual well-being, your self-confidence, and who, how your whole sense of identity. And what often happens uh, that those individuals get stuck in that pattern and then they start lashing out. They just lash out because that's their language. That's the only way they know how to communicate and get attention is to lash out. And so those are my clients. <laughs> those, those people come to work with me because they've, been, they've gone through EAP, they've gone through all the workshops, they've been everywhere. And they come to work with me and what they usually tell me is that, oh my goodness, for the first time, I'm spending time looking at myself, working on me, understanding what makes me tick, understanding my capacity for growth. I didn't know I could learn that. I didn't know I could do that. And they're so elated when they can transform a behavior and they've had a similar trigger as they had before. 
and they respond differently and they send me the emails and the phone call comes and they're like, I'm so excited. I didn't do it. Oh, I did it. So I, I got over, I moved past. And, and people just need a little bit of help to believe in themselves and to change their, their habits and develop new competencies. And those of us who, who've been blessed to do this work, our, our journey is to walk alongside them and help them to ask that bigger question. Is this all there is for me? Is there more that I can become? Do I have to be in this label? Can I change this? How else do I want others to experience me? And when we start asking those questions, people start to think because the brain is this incredible machine. When you ask it questions, it goes on a search. And once that happens, they come up with amazing answers, amazing ideas of who they want to be. And they start to listen to themselves and realizing that there is so much more. And I think when Linda said, it's like that whole idea out there of what they could possibly be, that, oh my goodness, I could actually do that. Joyce, I've actually done that. And, and I think that's where we get to do our best work is that little bit of divinity that allows us to align with another human being to see their best self. And I think that's why I love what I do. Well, most certainly. Well, interesting. Um, and, and please jump in if you have anything to add or question, but uh, sort of a comment that Joyce had mentioned when somebody, you know, switches or has the confidence, like as Linda said, and actions to change and do something else. So this is actually for Michael and Nanette. Because uh, Nanette, you know, a, a Miss Brainiac, a engineer, um, totally, and and again, you know, a, a female of color in a, and, and we talked about in a male-dominated world of engineering, um, you switch gears too, and with and with Mike too. So for the both of you, maybe give us a kind of feel and the confidence that you now both have in different ways. Of course, um, has that added to your new happiness? a new success? Nanette? Uh, it's made me hopeful for my daughter who has a very science, she's, she, she excels in STEM. And she is, uh, it, it gives me hope that she's got, she's, when I first started in engineering, in first year, there were 10 of us females. There were 10. And uh, of the 10 of us, there were about half of us left after first year. I was one of the ones who lasted <laughs> till the very end. And uh, the workplace was very interesting. Um, it was, uh, I, I found a lot of the responsibility going to the males. Um, a lot of the, uh, they le leaned on them a lot more. Uh, I felt like I had to prove myself a lot more than um than my male counterparts it's different now uh, if you go to the university of manitoba if you walk around the engineering buildings it's different it's a very welcoming environment for females and it's it's just like what what michael had said um you don't it, you need that little bit of friction you need that little bit of uh uh challenge for things to actually change, for things to improve for people. And there were a few of us during university that we stepped up and said, you know what, we need, we need more. We females need more. We need to be seen. We need to be considered equal in this. And it was slow. A lot of, it's a very, oh. <laughs> Um, it, it, back then, it was like 30 years ago, it was a very different environment in the university engineering faculty. It was, uh, it was a little, there was a lot of crassness. It was very, not very female friendly environment that started changing as I neared graduation. And it's a very different place now. And it makes me hopeful for, because of, because of all of the people speaking up and all of those changes were, happened and it makes me hopeful for my daughter who is I think she's leaning in that direction and I, I'm my hope is that it, it will change for her which is why it makes me hopeful for every all of the inequality that's 
right now that it will change. It will improve. You have enough people talking and bringing it to light. Things will happen. And I, I see that in the tech industry. And it gives me hope that things will change in other, in other areas of life. Yeah. Well, that's great. And Mike, for you, Mike, you, you, know, you said your life has changed. Yeah, my life has changed, but I wouldn't necessarily say happiness. Um, like Susie said, racism is a choice. Happiness is a choice. I've been happy all my life. I find whether I get more money and stuff, it just enhances who you already are. So, um, but I believe that it allows me to live my true me. You know, Joyce mentioned that we label ourselves with our job. So I'm very conscious. Even when I speak tomorrow on the 20th, I, I share what I do, but I also say who I actually am. I'm a student of life. Um, I just am, you know, whatever I apply myself. So I feel like it's all about perspective. You can't really sell, like I, I teach sales. Um, I'm a finance trainer. Um, I teach a high level of sales. Um, this company's industry leading because I teach you to never sell anyone something. You create awareness for them. And you, we, we're, all, we're, all, we're all amazing beyond belief. And we all have the answers in, and Joyce reflected on this, until you ask those questions. Those people don't realize those answers. But when they become to realize it, they realize that they actually have the answers within. So my job in life is just to inspire people to look at it from a different perspective so that they could see their own situation and reflect on it to gain those answers. It's what I call, and everyone knows it as empowering somebody. So through questions. So again, uh, on my phone, if I open it up and you were to look at it, it says my, my, my only goal in life is to inspire millions. And how I'm going to do that is by sharing uh, awareness. So when I share my story, I'm going to be very intimate about my story and the feelings I had. So people will see, no different from anyone else, what made me overcome these obstacles was just um, that mindset stuff and, and reframing some of these words like fear. When I quit, I called it Operation Mad. The reason why is because I know people would look at my side of things and they'll judge it and they'll say, why? That doesn't make sense. We all act so smart. We look at one piece of the puzzle and we fill in the rest. Imagine a thousand piece puzzle. Humans are more like a million piece puzzle. We look at one piece and we fill it in. Not many people would ask questions to understand, especially knowing you why you took the, took the, took the leap of faith. So the reason I call it Operation Mad, because it's like the number six. Depending on what perspective, you might see a six or you might see a nine. So Operation Mad is for people looking in at me, but my name is Michael Andrew DePizer, so it's mad. So we're looking at the same thing, but we totally have different feelings. So by reframing some of these concepts, I was able to, to make this um, big jump, which I, I will share on the 20th. So I feel like by giving somebody that story and sharing them that insight, they're going to be able to reflect in their own life of, you know what, I didn't consider that. And by that's where it all starts, I believe. Wow. Wow. So, um, Linda, like taking in all this information and, and again, I mean, Joyce, you got me thinking, you're right. Uh, this is the first thing you do when you meet someone for the first time. So what do you do? How should we rephrase that, Linda? <laughs> or what are some actions now that we can go forth and not be so hung up on what you do? On what we do. Um, I think uh, I, similar to what Michael was saying, as a, as a life coach and uh, listening to everyone here, one of the things that we have to be really good at is asking the people we're talking about really good questions, thought-provoking questions that are not, you know, maybe putting more the onus on the person who's asking the question to think of good questions, you know, not just reverting to, you know, what do you do and, and where do you live and, and but, you know, what, what is your passion? What is your drive? What, it, what, what makes you come alive? You know, that's always a, a really um, thought provoking question for people is it, what makes you come alive? What makes your, what makes your heart sing? What makes you, um, what makes, you know, what's your reason for getting out of bed in the morning? That's one question that, um, you know, when I'm working with people who are goal setting is, you know, to look at questions like, um, what, what's your purpose in life? Who do you want to help in this world? You know, do you have a, a particular group of people that you want to help or what, what is the, 
uh, what's something that really pisses you off that you want to change about the world? You know, like what, <laughs> what gets under your skin and you just want to, you know, get up and, and start making phone calls and, and, you know, creating change, you know, questions like that really inspire people to uh, remind themselves of why they're doing the work they're doing, why they're, why they're, um, why they're, uh, writing the posts that they're they're creating, why they're putting on the conferences they're putting on, like what what is the reason behind all of those things? And you start when you start to get people looking at um, their why, at their purpose, the steps that they need to take to become the person who can implement those those changes becomes clearer. You know, we we. Um, we really do our, we're, we are driven as, as Joyce said, by values, by what we, what we hold dear to our hearts and getting clear on that is, is so important. So I think the onus is on all of us to ask really, really good questions. Um, yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and see what comes from that, uh, rather than, um, even like I was thinking about, um, what Angela was saying too, about, um, let's not put the onus in the workplace on black people or people of color or indigenous people to figure out the solution. Uh, we need to be looking at the system and asking questions to the system uh, and the people, all the people in the system who are part of the microaggressions that happen daily, um, the exclusions that happen daily. Um, I, as you know, I have a business that I work from home and I do coaching from home. Um, and I've, over the last, um, uh, I've had this business for about a year, uh, looking at things, uh, you know, some, I, I noticed some people um, can be quick to go, well, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, as a person who works from home, there's so many things I can do to be inclusive in my business. I can make sure that the conferences that I'm speaking at are diverse, that the people on the panels are diverse, and that the boards that I sit on uh, look around the table, who's speaking, who's there, who's being invited, you know, um, looking at my mastermind groups, you know, uh, and going, wait a second, this is not reflective of our society. How can we change this? How can we, you know, um, uh, move forward, looking at my uh, social media feed, my blog posts, um, making sure that images that I'm using are diverse. Um, you know, I have a podcast as well. Uh, who am I passing that microphone to? You know, who am I, who, who's my guests? Who, you know, who are, who's speaking? And, uh, you know, as a speaker, I'm very conscious of that. Who has the microphone? You know, who has, who, uh, the microphone has a lot of power, you know, pass the microphone. Um, so, uh, yeah. So anyway, th that said, how about I pass the microphone? <laughs> but yeah, ask really good questions. That's, that's, uh, that was my point. Oh, wow. Um, and this is all for all of you. Um, so Tracy, Tracy can, we, yeah. can we go back to what Linda was saying there for a second? Yeah. So I think it's really important when she talks about like who has the microphone. That is something that we've discussed before in terms of um, how you can uh, give up your seat, basically, if you are a person of privilege, and offer that seat to somebody else who doesn't normally get the microphone, right? So every time I see on social media, on Twitter, on the internet, you know, a mantle or a bunch of people talking about women's rights and there's no women on the panel, like it just blows my mind that people don't have the self-awareness to understand that they don't need to be speaking on those issues. What they need to be doing is asking organizers or asking themselves, why was I asked to speak about this when I am not in a voice of authority on women's issues or, you know, uh, indigenous rights or whatever it might be, that microphone needs to be given to the people who have that experience, who have that lived experience and who can share that. And it's not, it's not a bad thing to say, you know, I'm not going to sit on this panel, but I have someone great who I think should sit on this panel and whose voice should be, you know, heard by everybody who could benefit from his or her knowledge. And that, to me, is a tremendous sign of strength and resilience to say, 
I don't need to have my voice here, but I want to hear somebody else's voice to give credence to this topic or to expand on this issue. That to me is a sign of not just allyship, but we talked before about what it takes to be a co-conspirator, right? I need you to flip those tables and say, no, I don't need to be here, but so-and-so does. And when you have a position of power and you can share that position with somebody else and empower, that's I am power, not E-M power, that is a position of strength and growth and grace. And that's how we can all move forward into whatever new future we're looking at with equality and justice for all. Amen. <laughs> I love microphone. that. I am, I am power. And I just want to say then, this is exactly what um, Amy Tung has done with the I Am Love Project. She has given up the platform to Joyce, Linda, Michael, and Natalie Bell, who will also be uh, speaking on Thursday, um, because these are, these are the lived experience people that can speak to, you, uh, you know, the Black place, workplace, and everything else that we've talked about. So I'm really looking forward to hearing, you know, the full version. But I mean, I, we've covered so many things today, but quickly, and um, it was a conversation that I, I had with Angela about gossip. And gossip has so many forms, and gossip is toxic mm -hmm. in so many different ways. So if I can go around and I guess on how to address how do we address gossip and and now you know thanks to COVID and isolation you know some have been you know in their own isolated pods and not hearing the water shed gossip or whatever or being involved in having to walk by someone that constantly matters at you yeah. but um Joyce how do we one yes. of the things that I, I teach uh, around gossip and, and one of the things that I, I say to employees, some people don't understand, uh, even they don't even have the awareness to know when their conversation has turned into gossip. And a, an easy way to assess, I said, if you find yourself saying something about someone that is not meant for their benefit, so you would be embarrassed if they were able to hear you, or you were worried that they would hear what you're saying. But if the conversation is about you, not to help, about the other person, not in a way to help them. It's one thing if you say, you know what, Tracy, I really want to talk to you about Angela. She is struggling with this and I want to help her. Can you help me? That is not gossip. But when you say to, you say, Tracy, did you see what Angela wore? What is wrong with her? That is gossip because you're not benefited. Angela is not benefiting from this conversation. It is not a conversation that's going to help her. So I, it's a, it was an easy way for me to get people to look at their interpersonal communication and to quickly identify when they've moved from a conversation that will help someone to a conversation that will that is about someone that is negatively degrading or taking away from that power person's uh, power in some way. And, uh, and they've told me that it has been very helpful. So that was my, my piece. Wow. No, that's, that's great. I mean, because we don't, we just get so wrapped up into it. I'll go with Angela too. I mean, it's, um, it's hard. Yeah. Well, and we talked a little bit about how uh, a lot of people in COVID, as they've been working from home, have noticed that there are some uh, work relationships that seem to be functioning better than they were when they were in that workplace. And it's kind of dissecting um, what makes, what was the difference. And I think people found that, um, oh, actually, when we were focused on work to, and a common objective, we, we get along quite well. It was the, that kind of um, water cooler talk or kind of other aspects that began to create additional friction. So I think as we're looking at strategies, um, when people are now working remotely more often, uh, you still want that connection and you still want to build relationship. But I think it also speaks to um, our identities and how linked they are to the workplace. And that, um, that gossip then perhaps begins to define who we are or how we label others. And it, it, it contributes to a certain uh, level of toxicity uh, and so what are the 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 positive lessons 
how do we take some of these as we re-enter into the workplace? And how do we use those moments of reflection to say, how are we gonna re-enter these workspaces differently? What are our expectations? And uh, what, where are where those traps that we fell into that perhaps now with some time to reflect, we can avoid moving forward? Right. And lastly, Mike, what kind of changes do you think are gonna come as we slowly move into going back to work? Well, it, it, it all depends, again, on those personalities. I don't believe we ever have work problems. We have personal problems that show up in our work. So until we align our human resources with some of this mindset topic, nothing's gonna change because people have these habits, right? When it comes to gossip, again, if someone's gonna gossip even about someone, well, it says more about them than the situation. So, so my goal in all this is to focus on those goals and, and bringing value to the table. When you bring value to the table, um, it's hard to focus on some of these other elements. So we have to, um, I guess, wonder where we're paying attention. So going forward, going back into the work, if employers don't take that time to align everyone to the same anchor, um, rather than showing up in these different personalities, I, I, I don't think there'll be much of a change. But for those who adopt that idea and guide their employees and um, empower their employees to, to see things from a different perspective, um, I think they'll gain some um, headway going forward because this COVID is all about change. Um, that's, that's really what it is. The only thing that's consistent in life is change. Yet when it comes, we curl up in a ball where the only place I ever found growth in my life was change. The bigger the growth, the bigger the change. We use this thing called logic too much to determine what the future will hold rather than looking at our past instances and seeing that everything that everyone here did when they started, they didn't know how it was to end up. And then what actually ended up is far more than they could imagine. That's why when I quit, I literally didn't have a plan because I knew if I had a plan, I would limit myself because what actually happens is more. Um, so you know what? Um, it all depends on the action that you know people take. My company has a great leader and we were able to come out of this COVID stronger than ever, but there was a strategy in place. My life when COVID came, I broke it down to five areas, financial, relationships, um, work, mental, and physical. Sorry, yeah, and physical. Every single area of my life, I'm, I'm, I'm blossoming more than I ever have in my life. So it's all about the awareness that we create within the workplace. So I think, again, if awareness doesn't change, nothing's going to change. It's going to get worse because people's personal feelings are coming out when these things show up. Right. And Rob, Tracy, if I can add something onto that, onto what Michael and what Angela said, is that if you know this whole um, COVID experience, working from home, uh, work relationships, interpersonal relationships, if we can take a look at how we have traditionally rewarded uh, leadership in the workplace, I think that we could start there and learn a lot of things, right? So when we look at what has really thrived in the workplace while we've been out of office buildings and that, you need to look at the top, right? So if your workplace is a place that is rife with gossip, that means that somebody at the top is approving that. That means that it's implicitly implied that that's okay to do. So we need to look at leader leadership, management, and understand how did these people get to these positions and why are they there? And if they no longer fit the values or the description of where this company is going, we need to have bigger discussions in the workplace about what that really means. And when people, when people ask me about success at work, I say, I look at my team and I see success. If I can bring out the best in them and bring out the best work, creativity, results, all those things, then I've done my job as a team leader. I don't need my team to, um, uh, to work for me, we are working together to create results. And if we have created a mindset of leadership and in management where it's us versus them, we're never going to get forward in terms of where we need to be. And we've seen that. We've, we have some lessons in our, in, in our city that we're looking at right now where that has taken place. And there needs to be a better onus on board governance, on C-suite leadership, and even VPs looking at how they're going to grow their teams in the healthiest way possible while at work. Wow. And I think there is going to be a lot of, I hope, a lot of that and maybe a lot of housekeeping done when everybody does get back to work. Wow. Um, and I just wanted to mention too, once again, it's the grow contact. Joyce, you had your finger. You want to add something, Joyce? Go yes. ahead. I, I love, you know, I, all I do, I'm, I mean, I'm a workplace wellness expert. That's where I spend my time. 
And in November, I'm hosting the Global Workplace Wellness Summit. And a lot of the, the things that we do is help leaders and employees to create a process for well being at work because gossip can affect the well being. We've had people who've gotten, you know, gotten ill because the gossip has been so detrimental to their well being and their sense of identity. I often say to employees, you never know what your action you might do, take at work that would be the last straw for someone else. Some people are coming to work and work is the only safe place they have. And when you take that away from them, you just take away their lifeline. And so all of us have to remember in the workplace that we're not equal, our realities are not the same, and our impact on others at work can mean life or death. I've had clients who try to commit suicide because of workplace issues. It's just too many times these things are swept under the rug. A lot of mental health issues, a lot of stress, a lot of um, these attempted suicide are coming after a workplace incident. So it's really important for us to ensure that the interpersonal dynamics at work, gossip, leadership, all of those elements are, are valuable and, and are cutting edge. And it's always being examined because that is necessary in order for us to attain workplace wellness because what happens at work permeates life. Everybody goes home and talk about the person at work that made their day miserable or great. And that's what, that's what their family hear and that's what their friends hear. So we do have to make a difference there. Wow. And lastly, Robin, you uh, put a comment out there for everyone. I want you to kind of share it just as we kind of close. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot again. Um, the last comment I put out? The, la the last comment, yeah. So uh, I think our roles, any of our roles, are to work ourselves out of a job because we support the people that are around us in the workplace to shine. And uh, that's my philosophy in anything we do in our business, whether we're working in workplaces or in kind of other places around mental health and peer support, is my job is to work myself out of a job because I support people to just live their truth and be the amazing people they are. Oh. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Again, you know, the conference is uh, Thursday, um, August 20th, if you're in Winnipeg. Sorry, my husband's washing dishes too. So, hey, this is reality too. Okay? Yes, Sorry. I know. That's all right. We can hear you. Um, anyways, it's at the Fairmont, and uh, we're going to have an amazing conversation, I know. Um, so excited that we will have a little bit of an audience there, you know, it's safely distancing in this craziness. But um, thank you all. It's been real pleasure on talking about, you know, a topic like this. And you're right, you know, we need to talk. We need to be take action. Thank you, Linda, and ask those um, very interesting questions and and. You know, I think, yeah, we're going to start getting some really different answers from even our, our best friends, right, that we talk to every day and out of the norm, ask them what they're passionate about. But um, thank you so much. And also, I just like to mention to all of um, our viewers out there and our listeners that uh, we do at Hugh have a discount for tickets to the Grow Conference. Just go to hashtag Grow With Hugh and we'll have more information on our Facebook. And thank you. All of our guests today will have their information on our Facebook. So Thanks so much, everybody. Have a wonderful Tuesday. It's going to be a beautiful day. Yes. Bye-bye. Wow. See ya. Bye.